one panelist. She'll be back soon. And meanwhile, these are the social media uh, huts, the spots that you can go to. That's the media. That's the website, the Twitter, uh, Facebook, and the Weibo. So, uh, I you know Charles has like five thousand, and on your face follows on your Facebook. Okay, so please spread the message, post it, um, uh, um, and uh, we can continue the the conversation. And for the presenters, for the speakers, the our staff has very stu in very studiously recording everything. If you have objection to, to have your session posted, have your images used, uh, let us know and we'll take it down. <laughs> the, the take down uh, operations here. But otherwise, it will be very accessible. So link it, treat it, pose it, and we'll continue the conversation. No, okay. Now, um, this is the final session and we'll just have to wrap things up. Um, I have instruction from Doreen that will end at 5.30, so people can have more networking. Uh, we saw that we would really want time to talk. And also, um, snack is outside, uh, tea and coffee is outside. And then we'll make, also make one attempt to do our group photo. We did that already. And we'll, we'll do it this time is that uh, we'll do it this way. And this will work. So we want to make sure yeah, we have everybody. Right and we'll, photograph, uh, we'll <laughs> Photoshop Andrew in, all right? All right. With permission, right? Uh, because Andrew has to leave at um, 5.15 uh, for, for the airport. But anyway, we... <laughs> food, there's such thing as Photoshop, all right? <laughs> uh, anyway. So um, we have two intensive days. I think it's been uh, 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 really amazing two days. It's so much information. And um, so we will have here the, the thoughts uh, and takeaways from uh, our panels here. But Andrew? Thank you very much. Um, Look, I was wondering what I would say at uh, the end of the two days, and I had one, a, a list of some brilliant quotes, but I, I don't want to start running through them because then I'll offend the people I, I leave out, because I did get, I've jotted down quotes from um, things people have said. Um, I will talk about one in just a minute, uh, which is actually something uh, Jill, I think, said yesterday. Um, so what I wanted to do was talk about two themes that came out for me, and they're challenges. We've been thinking about how, how much has changed and is changing in the internet age around media. And for me, I've thought about that a lot and I learnt a lot here. But I also thought about two new ways that it's going to keep changing and I've got to think of new ways to imagine it, engage with it, analyse it and act on it and try and support uh, pr um, helpful developments. So the first thing is binary. We heard this word binary a bit. And I was thinking about, you know, the internet, digital communications. If I understand anything about this, I'm not a scientist or an engineer. You know, there's lots of zeros and ones in binaries, right? This is very binary on one level. And law is very used to that. It's this or it's that. We have a new situation, common law method. We think, which is it closer to? Which makes sense to draw as an analogy? And that often works well. But the challenge here is to think sometimes in these new situations we need a different way to classify what's going on. We need to think of a different approach. So it's not just uh, you know, the publisher being like the notice board or being like uh, an another thing. It's, this is a different sort of engagement. Um, that is really challenging, but I think in 10 years' time we will be saying, hold on, we used to try and draw those old analogies. It just doesn't make any sense. Now we get what this new form of communication is. We don't yet, right? but we're starting to, to get glimpses. And so that was great to see. The other thing was uh, media. Right? This is media law and policy. And my background is talking about the journalism and defamation, most, most uh, commonly, that's what I've done. And so it's about institutional media. And most of the lawyers in the room, that's, that's who they interact with. 
and institutional media are really important, have been and will be. But it's not just institutional media now. So this other change is it's all speakers. Everybody is a publisher. And quite what that means for some of those old binaries in law, I think is a real challenge that we're only just starting to think about and we'll need to think about more. Ways that law can help people participate in public speech usefully. So for me, they were sort of two both exciting things to take away. And a lot of the two days were. And the other thing it, they were was sobering. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, areas in the world that have real challenges. It's fantastic to have heard from people who are finding ways to deal with them. Um, that I find inspiring to think about ways I might help in minuscule areas, but that's we can do what each of us can. And so that sobering thing is, I think, something to take away from the days. Because I do have to run off in a minute, let me also just say, I won't get to network later. It was wonderful to see friends and colleagues here and also to talk with many new people. And I'd really like to thank the organisers uh, for that aspect of the event too. So that's my two thoughts. Thank you. Um, and we have Dipendra, who's deep in the trenches. And a little depressing, actually quite depressing to hear from the uh, speaker in the last panel. So, and you've been working hard, and you also have the um, Southeast Asia Legal Network. Uh, uh, and so, your takeaways, your thoughts, and how do we go forward from here? Um, Southeast Asia will always be a challenge region, a challenging region for, for everyone. But I think um, this, the past two days has been beneficial, not just for me, but also for the lawyers from my network who are here. Uh, and, and before I quickly uh, introduce some of them, um, it has been an eye opener. And also for, for the network, my network, to know that we're not alone and we can count on various support from all around as we, as we try and do the right thing, try and try and promote rule of law, um, democracy, and use the judiciary, um, the judiciary that we have to try and effect some of these changes. Um, the, journey is, the journey does not end today for the Southeast Asian team. Uh, we have a third day tomorrow. Um, I hope, uh, in case if some of y'all don't know, there is a third day tomorrow. Same building on the 11th floor, there will be um, an entire day workshop dedicated to Southeast Asian issues. And if you are keen on learning um, and, and keen on understanding some of the issues in Southeast Asia from all the countries, from, from Burma to Vietnam and all the countries in between, please drop by. It's at the 11th floor. And uh, some of the things that we will be talking about are the individual challenges that each country has. You have to understand that some countries are common law, some countries are civil law, some countries have got different systems altogether. So how do we as lawyers try and manage that, try and deal with all the various problems that, that, that come from each country? And we would be going uh, a little bit deeper into uh, free speech and, uh, uh, and, the, and the criminalization of free speech, criminal defamation, sedition, and other penal offenses. I know the speakers in the uh, session earlier talked about it uh, in passing, in, in brief, but we will try and go into a little bit more deeper tomorrow and, and more country specific. And we will also have topics on cyber crimes and, and internet freedom, as well as the uh, media landscape for the next two years. So please, I hope to see as many of you, if not all of you, um, with the exception of Professor Kenyon, who has to leave at 5.15 uh, tomorrow, the 11th floor. But um, just very quickly, uh, uh, Professor Ying Chen, um, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be remiss of me not to you know, mention some of the lawyers from my network who are here. And if I can spot them out, maybe from Thailand, Ying Chip is over there. You need to raise your hand. Can you stand uh, there? We stand. Um, where's Asep from Indonesia? There he is. Uh, Gilbert, my legal officer. Where's, where's, where's Gilbert? Yep, he's there. Professor Roque, Harry Roque, you know. Um, uh, may, have, may have left already. Where's Alfred Dotwell from Singapore? Not here. Uh, uh, Attorney Tran Tu Nam from Vietnam. He's outside. Okay. And uh, Sovan from, from Cambodia is here. Um, Malaysia, uh, a couple of lawyers from Malaysia, Nizam Bashe and uh, Hien Ling. Uh, Romel from Philippines is also here. So uh, I've brought together a small team of lawyers and I hope they, 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 they interacted with some of you uh, in case if you have a fascination for a particular country. 
Uh, I urge you all to keep in touch. Uh, the network is always there to try and help uh, lawyers and journalists alike. Um, but it's been a wonderful two days, and I must say that uh, putting this together must have been a real challenge. I'm happy to have contributed in, in some small way, uh, and I hope this is not the only session. There will be more of this um, to come. Because then I think, um, and a little bit about Hong Kong, uh, in case for those of you who don't know, Hong Kong was where the uh, med My Network Media Defense Southeast Asia started. Uh, it started as a loose organization some six years ago in, in the University of Hong Kong. And I recall uh, Professor Ying Chan, Doreen, um, and, and some of the uh, some of the initial um, um, uh, initial promoters included um, uh, Stuart was there, Peter Nolander, uh, Mark Stevens as well, and um, Rob Balin, that's right, and um, and a few others. So it's been an interesting journey. They've been great friends of the network. They have helped us in 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 more ways than we can imagine. And I hope this continues for a long, long time until. Uh, we are satisfied that um, you know things are better for the region. Thank you. And Doreen, I'm sorry, Doreen. <laughs> Doreen. Yes, sorry. Um, Denny, your teacher, lawyer, and yeah, but uh, I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's learned a lot of the last couple of days. Um, I've also, over the past few um, few months, I've seen a little of just how much effort you and Doreen, Simon, and I'm sure. There are many others who, in the background, where well, we've seen them at the conference, have put it, but I've seen just a little of how much effort you've had to put into organizing this conference. And um, um, I'm certainly, and I'm sure all of us here are very grateful that you put all that effort in so we, we could learn so much over the past couple of days. It's been a great opportunity. Um, may I just say a little bit, um, possibly try and bring things back to, um, from a Hong Kong context, um, following on from the um, that excellent debate we had on uh, press regulation um, yesterday afternoon and uh, Lord Hunt was saying um, he's going to fight to the last breath in his body against uh, the Royal Charter in Britain and um, um, Jill, uh, Jill Phillips uh, paper for this conference saying that um, what happens in Britain can set the tone for other jurisdictions. Well, I think that's certainly true in Hong Kong. I mean, we're a small jurisdiction here. Um, the former Chief Justice once said as former jurisdi small jurisdiction, of course, we look overseas for our examples and while that's I think unequivocally a, a good idea when it comes to um, our courts and uh, our case law benefits immensely from that. Um, it's a bit more of a mixed blessing sometimes in the statutory and regulatory framework. Um, the Hong Kong government has this nasty habit of looking around the world for the worst possible examples they can find in the, anywhere in the well, in the, at least in the common law world. They tend not to go be, they still on balance tend to not go beyond the common law world, but they look for the worst possible examples they can find anywhere in the common law world and then use them as, a, as an example, as an excuse to argue for whatever they're pushing in Hong Kong. And we saw that, and Article 23 came up in the uh, last session, and we, we saw that in the Article 23 context. Uh, there's national security, proposals for national security legislation uh, 10 years ago, which were never enacted, and they uh, severely misrepresented some of the uh, national security legislation that exists elsewhere in the world. Um, now, I'm not suggesting for a moment, I agree entirely with Dennis Kwok, and also Tom, I think, asked the question that the political climate in Hong Kong is such that it's, it's almost, in fact, I go further than Dennis did. It's almost inconceivable that um, they would try and introduce um, Article 23 legislation again in the near future. Um, but I think that still what happens in, is happening in Britain, yes, it does have relevance here in Hong Kong. And we may see further, I mean, there are proposals floating around in the background in Hong Kong um, for, for statutory press regulation. Um, the Hong Kong government it appears to be sort of testing the water with, um, they put for, had a consultation exercise finished last year on an anti-stalking law. Now, an anti-stalking law is it's a very specific issue, and there's a lot of justification for such a law in, in terms of some of uh, the conduct that um, and people have been harassed in Hong Kong. But they've also made it very clear that that would just be it's if if that law goes ahead and there's not a big and it, there's not a big fuss about it, then they might well other con consider other legislation. And as I say, there are proposals on the back burner which. Um, um, Lord Hunt, I think you'd find some of them fairly similar to what you saw in Lord, Lord Justin Leveson's report. I mean, there's a, there was a proposal from the Law Reform Commission here, at least in their first version, um, um, 10 years or so ago, talking about uh, a regulator of the press, independent of the press, with the power to impose very, um, very large fines against members of the press. Um, so we need to watch what's happening overseas. We need to watch what's happening in Britain. 
if you ever got to the point where you had proposals for legislation in Hong Kong, I'm sure Lord Justice Leveson's um, proposals would be exhibit number one for the Hong Kong government. And if this Royal Charter goes ahead, um, I think the distinction between Royal Charter and statutory legislation would be uh, would be blurred. Would be exhibit number two for the um, for the Hong Kong government. So it's very very valuable to look at these kind of examples. And um, I hesitate to say it um, after all the work you put into this conference, but. Um, the dust hasn't settled in Britain yet, and when it has, um, another conference to um, to chew things up. <laughs> Dorian's already put up that had it would be very valuable, but I'll, I'll just leave that at that. <laughs> we'll draft you into the organising. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. Um, uh, as you can all see, I've got my special internet shirt on. I've got my Twitter shirt on, um, out of deference uh, to the topic. Um, I'll try and be very quick. Um, I, I don't know whether this analogy will work, but on the toilet door, in the ladies at least, there is a sign that says, to reduce the risk of germs, please close the toilet seat uh, before flushing. And in a way, that's the, uh, that's the easy way out with free speech. You can get rid of all the problems by closing the lid and shutting it all down. <laughs> and I just want to say that's not what we... That, that's not what we want to do. Um, press freedoms uh, and free speech rights that we all support and believe are um, not an end in themselves. They serve a democratic function that's in the public interest. Um, if people don't know what's happening in their society, if the actions of those who rule them are hidden, uh, and then that prevents them from taking any meaningful part in discussions about what is uh, going to happen to them and their future and they can't hold those in power to account. Um, and, and, th and that's what we're all here for, to try to preserve and make sure that that can happen. Uh, there's two things I want to I'm going to personally take away from uh, these two days. One is the power that you can gain from collective support. And if we all stick together, uh, we can help each other to help change attitudes and approaches in some of these repressive countries uh, where free speech really is uh, uh, under threat. The, and the second uh, following on from that is that we must all continue to help each other. And conferences like this are really good practical opportunities for us to forge links and make alliances to take forward uh, and to continue the fight. As Lord Lester said, we must be brave against taking the line of least resistance. Um, in terms of challenges, clearly, there are a lot of places that are worse than the UK but that doesn't mean that the UK can sit back and be complacent. We've heard the problems around the Royal Charter and, and regulation, um, and I'm not really going to go there. I mean, as far as the internet is concerned, I think there are some real issues about how, you, how and whether you should regulate it. Uh, some say the internet is where most of the abuse on free speech occurs. We've heard mentions of the extremes of cyberbullying and suicide. The internet is highly decentralized. It can intimidate and intrude. We've got to strive, we've got to work in, in all our different positions to find the right balance that allows uh, those who need to be protected to be protected while allowing <laughs> free speech to flourish. That's our, that's our job. That's the future challenge for all of us, to work out how we can, how we can achieve that. <clears throat> um, uh, just a little tiny plug for one of the problems that was occurring in the UK that Leveson highlighted, which is plurality. Plurality is an issue we haven't really talked about much uh, over these two days, but you need to have uh, a climate where diverse voices and opinions can be heard. And, and that is something that the commercial media, the big media, uh, n can contribute to and need to be able to continue to do that. And making sure that you have a flourishing media, whether it's a hard copy print media or a digital one, is also a very important part of this, this big picture. Um, the David Miranda, Ed Snowden stuff, all I want to say about that is the UK government are trying to argue that this is not about journalism. Well, don't be fooled by that. It is about journalism. What David Miranda was doing is about journalism. Um, and the, the UK government are currently trying to argue that the mere publication by The Guardian of the prism stories, for example, is an act of terrorism. So be worried about things that still happen in the UK. Um, uh, and, and finally, um, the, the, the Big Brother challenge clearly hasn't gone away. And in, in a way, the internet has you know, is, is made, it, made it harder. Um, and 
we all need to be aware, whether we're lawyers or journalists or academics, of the role of the state and the government. Um, on the back of the Snowden disclosures, the US government has said it's going to have an open and transparent debate around surveillance, uh, and state surveillance in particular. And I think for all of us, we all need to be pressing all our governments to be looking at these things and being open and having proper debate, again, about proportionality in these issues. Of course, we need national security, but uh, it, it's a question of how much and how it's dealt with. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Lord Lester, you're the instigator. Can we take a break now, or are you going to call us 12 midnight tomorrow? Uh, as you say, uh, it's all my fault. Um, uh, I did not expect the conference to be anything like the success it has been. Uh, there was a time when I wondered whether there'd be a conference at all. Uh, uh, as you know, or ought to know, uh, I'm on the one of the sub-boards of the Open Society Foundation, the Justice Initiative one, and I shall be reporting back to them that I think they have spent their money, not enough, but they've spent their money uh, really well, because I think this has been a most remarkable occasion. Uh, I, I have learned a huge amount. Uh, and it's raised many more questions uh, for me than answers. There are just a couple of reflections. Uh, I, I want to say something about the British team, if I can call it that. Um, I want to thank Jill, uh, uh, and I want to thank Don Dyson, <coughs> and I want to thank David Hunt and Heather Rogers for being here at all, because, because all of them uh, came yeah. under great pressure from, the, from what they had to do in their own country. It's easy for me because I'm basically just an unemployed old uh, <laughs> parliamentarian. But for them, they were, they were leaving behind uh, really demanding things. And they'd come at very short notice. It's not very enjoyable to arrive and to go back again with double jet lag. And they've all done that. And I, and I, and I thank them as fellow citizens. Um, I'm not going to try and thank everybody else, but I just want to say one or two other things. Um, as, a, as an old advocate, uh, one, one thing I think I have learned uh, is that it's very important to understand the mindset of your opponent. Uh, in 1944, Judge Learned Hand, standing in Central Park, uh, gave a speech which he called <coughs> the spirit of liberty. And in that speech, he said, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. Uh, and I've had, actually had that inscribed on a piece of stone in my office to remind me not to be dogmatic and to think about the other point of view. Some years ago, some distinguished Chinese came to my chambers as part of an official visit, uh, and I showed them this statement, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. <laughs> and the interpreter interpreted it, and their brows wrinkled. And I said, please translate it again. And they did. Uh, and they still looked very confused. And then I suddenly realized the problem was not linguistic. It was cultural. Because they could not understand how uncertainty and lack of sureness that you are right could possibly be a principle. It, it went completely against the grain for them to think of uncertainty as a principle. Uh, now, I feel very strongly that we will not make progress unless we can get into the minds of those who disagree with us. Let me give you one example. I never thought I'd say anything good about Lee Kuan Yew, who, after all, banned me from practice in Singapore. <laughs> but, when you, but think about Lee Kuan Yew. See, when Lee Kuan Yew read law at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, at the same time as Geoffrey Howe, we had no public law. Uh, the English judges at that time were more executive-minded than the executive. They were like the judges today in some parts of Southeast Asia, <coughs> in many ways. So when, when Malaysia when Malaya and Singapore became uh, uh, united 
in independence in the Federation, and they saw that the British had written into their constitutions fundamental rights. They thought, well, that's fine. It doesn't really mean very much. It's never going to be used very actively. <coughs> what they didn't realize was that the British judges would begin to develop principles of judicial review that were strong and independent. And suddenly what began to happen in places like Mal Malaysia and Singapore was that they began to read decisions of the Privy Council that bore no relation to what they had learned when they were at university. So I can, in a sense, understand Lee Kuan Yew with his Asian values, with his dictatorial ideas, being completely astonished by the cultural clash which has occurred in his lifetime. And I think it's important to understand that. I mean, I, I, I totally disagree with it. I will fight it till I die. But it's important to understand that that is where the other <coughs> point of view is coming from. And I think the same is true of many of the issues about secrecy and state censorship and so on. It's really important if we are going to make progress to, yeah. to think about the other point of view. When we were fashioning the the, the justice initiative principles about national security, uh, we were very careful to involve people from the other side in fashioning the print. We wanted to hear from governments. Uh, so I think that that's an important additional thing because this conference has been brilliant, but it's been very one-sided. It hasn't had uh, the people here who are going to disagree with us and will have power and will take decisions. I think the other thing I wanted to say is that every part of the world uh, has to fight its own corner as well as joining with everywhere else. Don't think that in Europe we're in some kind of special area of privilege. Uh, the future of the European Court of Human Rights, I promise you, is threatened. There are 800 million people in uh, subject protected by that court, it is threatened. The relationship between the United Kingdom and that court is threatened. <laughs> the future of our Human Rights Act is threatened. And we've seen that press freedom through this misconceived stuff post Leveson is extremely threatening. We have to fight those battles, and they are every bit as serious as the kind of battles that are being fought in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, and in uh, countries like New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. So what I take away from this is a huge amount of thought and a desire to do more. And I think that if there's anything, any way in which we can help, we should do so. The last thing I want to say is that I once taught 50 lawyers in the Ukraine about human rights. And at the end, as we were leaving as we are now, I said to them, because they were very bright uh, and very good. And I said, we've now spent three days on human rights standards. Uh, how can we help you? And they said, by getting us out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I said, and I said, what do you mean? Are, are you serious? They said, yes, of course. You've been teaching us all these fine principles, but there are no courts in the Ukraine that are independent. So everything you've taught us is actually never going to come to pass. It's worth bearing that in mind. But thank you very much indeed for everything. Thank you. So we still have a lot to do. That means you will call. But I, I'll pass it to Doreen and Simon. Doreen has wanted to say something. Um, in response, uh, Lord Lester, to your comment, we don't have the other side here. It wasn't from lack of trying. Um, we invited many people to. Uh, Come. But as suspected, um, it's hard for them to come to a public forum and be able to speak more candidly and freely. So we have to continue efforts. And we've already formed a few bonds here of people that we're uh, connecting with others in government and other uh, uh, points of view to continue this dialogue. Uh, the only thing I want to say, I'm not going to go into the substantive um, uh, uh, observations. I think it was well covered by the panel here, is that when I I and Simon and Ying and others uh, from um, this uh, organizations uh, who put together this conference invited you to this global dialogue. 
Um, I wondered at the time, was this too ambitious to say? But no, I think that we've accomplished that. Uh, one thing that we've learned also is that change can only happen with at least one person starting. And we learned from Lord Lester making his Everwoods private bill. But we've heard from so many other stories of all of you in the 15 different countries who are represented in this conference today. But change can only continue with the cooperation of everyone and with others. And so that's what we're hoping with uh, the alliances and ties that are forged here in Hong Kong that we continue this battle. Will we be successful? In the words of our lunchtime speaker, Mr. Pooh, I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> Simon. And Simon is a real host. You know, let us use this beautiful hall. Thank you, thank you. And this may be nearing the end of the conference, but of course it's not the end of the dialogue, right? And we've put the information on the slide here, and we hope that we will continue this dialogue, although in a different, different medium. Now, I've, um, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, I've, I've been the, center, uh, the director of our Center for uh, Comparative and Public Law uh, for six years. I ended my term this year. Um, and we've organized many, many events. But this event, I think, was really, really special uh, for a number of reasons. And I just want to highlight why I think that that is the case. The first reason is, of course, how, well, well, I'll say now we, but of course it wasn't we, it was, it was of course Lord Lester, but how we had thought big right from the beginning. Thinking big, but not, with no real idea of how we're gonna actually achieve it. But at least having those big ideas, I think that's really the, of central importance. Right? And with, for that, we have Lord Lester to thank. Right? Thinking big, and, and for us, when we started meeting, just trying to find out what, what is this big idea and how is it going to be possible. And slowly but surely, we saw it materialize. And I think the second reason why this has been such a successful conference is because we work closely with a partner, the journalism school. We haven't really had such major cooperative events before, but this time we did. And by doing so, it's, it's multidisciplinary. You have contacts that, and, and net, networks that come together and, and then together we form a much bigger network and ideas and speakers and, 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 and just disciplines that are different from each other. And that, I think, we see the product of that in, in just uh, the, the representation and the different kinds of views that have been expressed uh, in today's event. The second reason, of course, uh, as Lord Lester has mentioned already, is really the speakers that we've been able to get uh, for this event. And, and usually September, October, it's a really busy time for, for most people, but we're just so lucky that we've been able to get speakers who were agreeable to come here and fly so far to be with us. Uh, and, their, and, their, and their speeches and their presentations have really been really meaningful, and they've just shown us uh, you know, a, a different world in many respects. Uh, for example, you know, in Hong Kong, of course, we sometimes like to pat ourselves on the back and think that we have got a you know, fairly decent judiciary, independence of the judiciary, with good, fairly decent rule of law. But we saw very quick, quickly from Lord Dyson's presentation, of course, that there is another judicial world that we can strive towards uh, uh, someday. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we, you know, we can't be complacent uh, anywhere uh, where, where, we sit, where we stand. And of course, another reason why this has been so successful is just all of you. Uh, and you know, it's amazing that you're still, you know, as I say, still here. But of course, you want to be here because uh, this is important, uh, what we're talking about. And I have to differ with Lord Lester and, and, and Doreen. You, you say it's one-sided. Actually, actually, there were a lot of Hong Kong government people here. So from Hong Kong's perspective, they were very quiet. <laughs> we, had, we, we had the Secretary of the Law Reform Commission here. We had the former Secretary of the Law Reform Commission here. Right? We had the Deputy Secretary. Uh, here. We had a number of uh, people from the Hong Kong legal policy people. And they were here for both days. They weren't just here for certain speeches. So I'm, I, I'm very optimistic that from Hong Kong's perspective, we're going to have an impact. Right? The, why, why are the policy people here you know, on a Saturday? And, you know, yeah, right? They're, they're doing work in this area. I'm, hope, I'm hoping. I don't know for sure, but I'm hoping they're doing work in this area. Right? And, and, and I'm optimistic. 
uh, that what we've done is it will contribute to something, at least in Hong Kong. Um, and of course, you know, the most important contingent I haven't really mentioned here uh, is really all the people behind the scenes. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> nice and loud, please, because many of them are actually them to come standing up? out. They're actually outside. Right? So you tell have them to, to you come have in. To, you have to Can really, you tell them to come in? Take yeah, a bow. You have to please tell tell everyone to come in. Yeah, they would right? feel really. Firstly, the, the people in the Faculty of Law, um, you know, Flora Lur has just Flora? been. Uh, uh, is she still there? She may or may not. Come on in, please. Come, come on in. in. Everybody, come on yeah, in. We just want to recognize uh, your efforts. Flora? Is Flora out there? Flora. Yeah. Come on out, please. So we. We needed student volunteers, and we sent out an email to all of our students to see you know, uh, uh, who was interested. And we had dozens of students uh, uh, interested in, in volunteering for us uh, because they wanted to be part of this. Uh, so here's just some of them here. And, and you've, met, you've met many of them taking photographs, helping to guide uh, our guests around. Uh, so please, can you just uh, uh, show your appreciation for all of their assistance? And the Matthew, where, Matthew is here. Uh, can the other journalism folks come forward? Come on. Um, the team is the AJ. AJ, stand up. Don't be shy. He's our chief photographer. So if you want your nice pictures, he's the guy. Darcy, who uh, put together that uh, fabulous website quickly. Darcy is still here. Rebecca, Rebecca. Um, we'll send you all the har harassing emails. Darcy, Rebecca, come on, move, move, move. That's it. You're journalists. Come on, move fast. Come on. OK. So uh, is Rebecca there? She's coming. OK, just, OK. So um, thank you very much. These so, are the really people who um, Yeah, thank you. once again, thank you very much. All of you. Of course, they're, they're probably busy and doing Roy. something for the conference. That's why, that's why they're not here. So, <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So, um, with that, uh, do we want? Do we want to say any more things? Anything else? I, uh, Simon, I think this is okay. a, Yang, but you wrap it up very, very well. And thank you so much. And uh, all good things have to come to an end. But I'm, I'm sure this is the start of many good things to come. Uh, OK, that's uh, Rebecca. So we've been uh, sending you an email. Yeah. Um, so uh, tea, coffee, and some snacks are served outside. But first, please come forward. We really, we need to do a good picture this time. And I want to thank everybody. Let's give ourselves a good hand. Thank you so much.